Well, hello, and thanks so much for tuning in for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. And with me, I've got three of our uh, veteran panelists joining us on the show to give you some great advice and answer some of your questions. So let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about what they're into. So Jennifer Nelson, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist. You can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. And my favorite topics are vegetable gardening, house plants, um, and general horticulture questions. All right. And Jennifer Fishburn. Hello, Jennifer Fishburn, University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator, and I'm located in the Springfield area. Um, while I can talk just about anything, this time of year, my favorite things to talk about are vegetables and herbs. Wonderful. All right. And last but not least, Ms. Ella. Um, I'm Ella Maxwell. I work at Hare Nursery in Peoria, Illinois. I'm also a master gardener. And i uh, I can answer most any horticulture questions, but I really like um, perennials and shrubs and trees. Awesome. Okay, so we've all got some show and tells to uh, to get into. Uh, I'll start because I usually don't bring show and tells, but this one I had to share with you guys um, as we're into harvesting. Uh, I'm trying my head for scale. How about we do that? <laughs> this is a, a <laughs> lovely, lovely cabbage. Uh, my in-laws had a wonderful, wonderful cabbage cabbage crop this year. Um, and have been sharing these with us. And so they are jam-packed with flavor, huge, obviously. Um, so not everyone in my house eats cabbage. So ladies, my question with my show and tell is, uh, how do you keep these fresh in your fridge or in your house um, as you're sort of munching on it and, and working on these? What's the best way to keep them from getting discolored or keep them from getting wilted? Um, what are some tips that you guys use? So uh, Jen, Nelson, I'll start with you. What do you, what um, do you I usually cover the cut end with press and seal and it seems to work well. And I occasionally I have to do a, a fresh cut if it starts to look a little dried out or mm -hmm. questionable. Okay. Anybody else? How do you store yours? Um, I go ahead and just put it in a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. And um, I always make a fresh cut. And usually I'm using at least a quarter or half of a cabbage at a time. But and those this are big guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big one. What about you, uh, Ms. Fishburn? Anything? The only thing I'll add to that, I, I don't know, I think this was mentioned, but make sure that that's put in the refrigerator in a crisper section to keep it cool. That'll, that'll keep it the freshest. Just Go on to the websites and look for some good recipes. Eat it up fast. Yeah, <laughs> but exactly. Keep for a while. Awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's my show and tell. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, Jennifer Nelson. You well, show I've me? I've got another cabbage relative for my show and tell. This is kohlrabi, which is actually this. It's the same as cabbage. They all cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kale, they all come from the same ancestor and they've just been selected for different things. So kohlrabi is selected for this swollen stem. And most of the time, this is what we eat. You actually have to um, kind of peel it off. You can eat it roasted or um, otherwise cooked, but I've only ever eaten it raw, just sliced thinly with some salt and pepper. You can um, eat the leaves too, like you would collard greens or kale. I've never eaten them, but maybe I should should give that a try. But they're a great um, early spring crop or fall crop. They would be harvested like now is when I'm first getting them, just like your cabbage. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to put another crop in so I can get a fall crop. They're, they're kind of on the sweeter side. i what's one of my favorite vegetables and it's one that a lot of people look at me kind of funny like what the heck is that but try it and it comes in a, pur a few different varieties usually green there's a purple variety too out there awesome i've never eaten uh it raw before i've sauteed them pan sauteed them um and kind of cooked them like a fried potato um but okay. i've heard a lot of people who just slice them and maybe sprinkle a little salt on and, and just have them raw, of course, ranch, because we're in the Midwest, and that's what we do. <laughs> well, I'm going to be eating it when we're done taping the show. That's what I'm looking forward to. There we go. Done. There we go. Okay. All right, Jen Fishburn, you have a show and tell or something to discuss as well? Well, I'll go ahead and show I've uh, little pickler cucumbers today. I just wanted to mention 
if you're new at gardening, uh, make sure that you save those seed packets and know what you actually planted. Uh, I see a lot of people incorrectly sometimes picking them. These when they're eight inches long as a slicer, and these are actually pickling cucumbers. So you'll pick them when they're about three to four inches long. I show you two sizes here. Um, one's a little bigger than I typically pick it, but the, the, the ones that just get a little bit longer, maybe five inches or so, uh, those are great for pickling to make um, pickles with. Um, but the smaller ones, I like to, to eat those fresh. Um, but just don't let them to get too big. If they start to turn yellow and get discolored, they're usually overripe. So just wanted okay. to, re to remind folks of that. All right, and you guys, um, the two Jennifers kind of have a, a co-show and tell. Um, talk about this phenomenon that we've been seeing lately of, of people saying that they've received some seeds in the mail and just some good education um, to go along with that. I'll let you start, Jennifer. Oh, okay. Um, I will say that I saw a story being circulated on the internet about people getting seeds in the mail that they didn't order from China. And I thought it was a, a joke. I thought it was just more garbage on the internet. And then Jennifer called me up and said she knew a couple of people that had actually received these packages and it was a legit thing. And a couple other friends that I trust had also said they knew some people too. So um, and Jennifer, we were both talking about this before the show that what we should do is really make sure people realize do not plant what's what came in the mail. If you didn't order it and you don't know what it is, don't go ahead and plant it. You don't you don't know if it's an invasive plant. You don't know if there's some sort of disease or pest attached to what you've received. So you could be creating a giant problem on top of everything else we're dealing with these days, right? We just need one more thing. It's like another horseman of the apocalypse <laughs> to add to the fun. Um, and the advice we wanted to get, uh, get across to uh, viewers is to take that package that you received, seal it up in a bag, wash your hands and call your local extension office and get in touch mm -hmm. with the horticulture educator there. And they will make sure that that gets to the proper authorities because they are wanting, the USDA is wanting to figure out exactly what they're dealing with. Is it just, is it something malicious or is it something that just is just a random act of, I don't know, the internet or whatever. So, interesting jennifer interesting. Is, am i leaving something out of no um i think you're exactly right and uh, we just want people to be aware that if you didn't order it um don't use it don't right. don't um use those seeds don't plant those seeds it's not necessarily a free gift um <laughs> but i will segue into um during this time in late july the uh, illinois extension sent out together we bloom packets of seed that have forget-me-not seeds or wildflower seeds in them, and those are legitimately sent to you. Uh, they sent those as part of a, a promotional tool um, to make sure that people realize the importance of the 2020 census and, and take part in that. Um, so those are legitimate seeds. They're forget-me-not um, they're clearly labeled who they're sent from. Mm -hmm. And if you do receive those, save those until next spring, plant them out in your garden space about a quarter of an inch deep, and they will grow about five to, two, to 12 inches tall. And the main thing people wanna do with those, they'll have a really pretty blue flower, is to deadhead those, cut off those dead flowers um, so they don't self sow. Gotcha, okay. All right, and that kind of leads right into uh, what Ella is gonna be discussing. But before we move to that, ladies, and, and Ella weigh in on this as well. Have we, has anyone identified what the seeds are that people have been receiving? Have they put no, any it, information it about is, that yet? It is fairly new. I think uh, most people have received those this latter part of July. Mm -hmm. And so the USDA is currently working on how to, uh, to deal with this at this current time. So uh, watch daily news and um, keep an eye on, on what they're telling you, but no, they have not figured out where it's coming from exactly or what the idea was behind it. Fascinating. Okay. I'll add the, picture, the pictures that I've seen have been all different sorts of seeds. I, I haven't seen, they're not all one kind, so. Gotcha, okay. We'll have to keep an eye on that one because now I'm interested. Mm -hmm. I've seen the post. Um, some of the seeds were bigger and they, they, they were different varieties. So um, hmm, we'll have to see what that turns out to be. Okay, so in the spirit of deadheading and, and making sure that things don't recede, Ella, uh, that's going to be her demonstration 
splash show and tell. So take it away, Ella. The, the idea is, is not so much to uh, self seed, but to continue to flower. So I have three different common perennials that um, I would recommend cutting the spent flowers off to encourage new blooms to continue. So the first one is salvia here. And this is a little short one called Marcus, but you can see that it's pretty well spent. And really for deadheading, this is a different type of pruning. You're just removing the spent flowers. So you can actually use like a little shear or scissors. Um, you could use a, a pruner, but I think it's quicker and faster. And um, so this would be something that you would cut back to encourage, you know, new like little purple flowers to come up again. And you can do it with a coreopsis. So once they're done flowering, you give them just like a light shear and then they'll rebloom. And one of the plants that uh, definitely benefits from it, and there's now a couple different varieties, are the cat mints. And at first there was a cat mint called Walker's Low, and everybody thought it was gonna stay small because of the name, but it's really where it came from. Now they have some new proven winners, cat's pajamas and meow. But once these are done flowering, if you cut them back, it keeps a nicer uh, habit and also you get a quicker rebloom. So that's my uh, show and share for today. Wonderful. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, we're going to go to some uh, questions that you have sent in. And Jennifer Fishburne, we'll start with you. Question 928 um, asks about thorny ornamentals. Um, it reads, I have several thorny ornamentals that I would like to prune. Could you please identify the type of tree for me and give me a time frame for optimal pruning season? The close-up photo shows the leaf and thorn structure. So, First question is, what is this and a good schedule or time frame for pruning? So what I see in the pictures is a hawthorn tree. They will grow, depending on the type, anywhere from 15 to 30 feet tall. So they're a smaller tree. Um, and the good news is they, they do put a, on a fruit that the birds, it will persist, in, persist into the winter and the birds will eat that fruit. So the first part of the answer is it's a hawthorn. Um, when to prune, you'll want to do that when they're uh, in late dormancy, so maybe November, December time frame, definitely after they've shed their leaves. Um, and that's for most, most pruning, um, except for if it's uh, storm damage or, or a limb that's going to be a hazard, you wanna, you'll want to do that when they're dormant. Uh, another option I would offer is he could increase the amount of area that he's mulching. So mulch out to the drip line on those trees and then he won't need to mow underneath them and they can stay at their more of their natural habit look. Um, so that's, a, that's another option and the mulch will, will help keep that soil temperature consistent um, and more even moisture and also reduce the competition with the lawn with the trees roots. Wonderful answer. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Okay, Ella, we're going back to you. Question 937, okay. uh, sm swamp milkweed bugs. Question is, are the little yellow aphids harmful? I see two centimeter long orange black insects on them too. Maybe the aphids are their babies. So little yellow bugs on milkweed and are they harmful? Um, they are not harmful. These um, native plants do have lots of insects that will utilize uh, the plant. And we think about monarchs and their caterpillars and how wonderful that is, but there's also an aphid that um, feeds on them. And the easiest way to get rid of them is to just hose them off, or you can put on a cotton glove and kind of wipe them off. But they're using, uh, they're feeding on the plant sap and uh, they can cause some distortion. Um, they are not the babies of that other um, milkweed plant bug. It's actually a true bug, and it has little babies that look kind of like the adult, and they also feed on milkweed, as does a tussock moth and lots of others. So mm -hmm. um, I would not want to use insecticides uh, 
necessarily on any milkweeds. And I think just uh, wiping them off or uh, hosing them off is the easiest way to take care of any problems. I've seen, um, for this is the first year and I'm going to probably mess up the name, but is it the fuzzy aphid or the furry aphid? The one that looks like it's got a little piece of cotton on the back of it? Does that ring that, a bell? It's an adelgid and it is an aphid relative. And there is also a leaf hopper that in its juvenile stage, it's able to float on these little mm -hmm. white wisps as well. And I've had those on my um, uh, lilies. But again, not normally a real problem and everybody should get a shot at, you know, a chance to live. <laughs> Everybody deserves a shot, right? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. All right, we are going to go to a joint question now, 935. This will be a venture by both Jennifers uh, regarding garlic. Okay, here we go. Um, what is the earliest date I can plant my fall garlic and elephant garlic? Also, I have a question about elephant garlic. We know nothing about it. What dishes slash recipes is it used in? Thanks for your help, Pete. So I will let you ladies divvy this question up however you like. <laughs> so the short answer to that question is garlic is typically planted one to two weeks after the uh, uh, first killing frost. Typically in Illinois, that can range anywhere from September to October. So that's the short answer for him. Um, garlic needs to be planted in well-drained soil with a pH of about six to seven and it, it likes um, somewhat of a moisture retentive soil. So Jennifer, I'll let you add to that. Okay, and elephant garlic is actually not garlic at all. It's a leek and it has a milder garlic flavor. So basically you would use it wherever you would normally use garlic. And maybe if you're not as fan, uh, as much of a fan as the of the really strong garlic flavor, you could still get a little bit of it. I don't know that it, I don't know that it stores as well as real garlic, but Probably yeah. not. Yeah, Ella's shaking her head. I yeah. didn't think so. It's probably just got too much moisture in it. Interesting. Ella, tell us more about elephant garlic. Does it look the same? Does it have the bold oh, little? Yeah, little it's just way, way bigger. The cloves, individual cloves, are about the size of a regular whole head of garlic. So it can be quite large. And, and like Jennifer said, it doesn't store as well, but it's a wonderful plant to grow and use. And then you can save the individual clove and replant it. And um, I, there are two different types of garlic. There's the hard neck garlic that'll send up a scape and mm -hmm. the, the flower little, Curl is edible. You can saute those. But then what you see in the stores is the soft neck garlic. And that one does not have that little center stem in it. But uh, they they are all robust, easy to grow. And um, again, I usually plant in mid-September. I've already harvested all my garlic now. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to go back to Jennifer Fishburn. Question 934. Um, my formerly lush wine and roses, oh man, is it Wigalia? Wigalia? How do I mm -hmm. pronounce it? Yes. <laughs> um, had no blossoms this year. Is there any hope for it? This is Kathy from Charleston. So she did submit a, a photo and it is, she does show half of it has some, some dead branches. Um, this can be typical for Illinois uh, to see this this winter injury to the plant. The best thing to do is in the spring, uh, when you when it first starts to bud out, is to remove the the dead branches um, and then wait till it leaves out. And you may need to remove a little bit more, but cut it just above the the new growth that, or the growth that you see coming out. Um, typically, this will bloom on the older wood, but it can also bloom somewhat on the newer wood. So she may may have gotten a few blooms from it. Um, but this is just something that we we see in our area and you can just trim it back. The now how, do, back. how do you pronounce that? Uh, the jury's still out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody pronounces it a little bit differently. Jennifer, you want to? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I find, you know, as a newbie to the plant world within the past, I, I won't say newbie, I've been gardening for a while, but using proper terms. Yeah. And yeah. You just can't ever get a grasp on some of these names. 
<laughs> I've Ellis, said, how about you? <laughs> um, I say Wygelia. Yeah, okay. I, I say Wygelia too. I, but okay. it's one of those words you don't like often speak it out loud. So you're like, oh, geez, am I saying it the <laughs> yes. right way? Yes. I don't know how you guys got through your coursework having to do, you know, some of this out loud in the classroom because yikes. <laughs> well, I'll have to I'll have to share a small tip for everybody. Uh, when I'm not positive, I go to Missouri Botanical Garden and I Google the in their plant finder and they have a pronunciation. If you click on it, it'll pronounce the word, the the scientific name for you. you just so that, that's my, my little trick. Yeah, I've, done that. I've a, done that too. <laughs> that's about to become my life hack. <laughs> Okay. Now, now my now my secrets out. <laughs> the secrets out. We're all going to be pros in no time. All right, uh, back to Ella. Question nine thirty eight. This is about white flies. It reads: I have a hibiscus plant which is approximately fourteen years old. Wow. Unfortunately, it has white flies, and we can't find a way to destroy them. They've tried granular. They've tried traps, capsules, and different types of spray. The traps are covered, but nothing seems to get rid of them. Um, what suggestions do you have, Kathy? That's so sad. <laughs> Sounds like they've, they've run the gamut. So Ella, is there any way for them to get some protection for their plant? Well, um, they didn't send in a picture, so I'm not sure the size of the hibiscus, but it could be rather large. And um, the white flies, feed and uh, lay eggs on the undersides of the leaves. So when you're treating, you wanna make sure that you spray from the bottom up. Uh, also the white flies, they may be sitting with other plants in the area. So the first thing that I would do is isolate the hibiscus to an area all by itself and for maybe a week or two and really concentrate on treating. And I think a liquid spray is, um, and there are, I think, some aerosol products as well. And maybe uh, setting it in the shade in a, you know, and spraying it and putting like a plastic bag over it, kind of the way that they might um, fumigate a house or something could be the ticket to really control. But you'll have to make several applications because the egg form is not really treatable. I don't think the systemic products work exceptionally well for white flies and um, some of the granular ones also. So I think some type of liquid or aerosol spray would be best. You just have to be more diligent, isolate it and see what you can do. Um, we've got about three minutes left and there's one sort of big question that no one was assigned. So we'll just all attack it together um, and see what we can do. Uh, this is, these are folks who have uh, lots of experience in the garden. DJ, this is question 936. Um, lots of experience in the garden, big garden. Um, they've got a problem with the last couple of years with having some fungus or what they think is fungus, um, harvesting great big watermelons, lots of tomatoes, um, but are seeing some fungus there. It says we get leaf roll and then black spot. Then the stems get cankers and blistering. Soon the plant is practically dead. Some do fight through, but they're getting little harvest. So how do you go from this great big garden with a bountiful harvest to having um, fungus leaf roll, black spot, cankers, and blistering. What are some things that you guys think they're seeing in their garden and some suggestions? Well, we've had a really, really wet spring the last two springs. So I think that's probably environment is contributing to this. Um, yeah. Not much you can do about that. Um, they said they're rotating their crops. That would be like one thing I would automatically suggest, but um maybe looking at what varieties they're growing and maybe they need to select some with resistance to some of the more common fungal pests. They also didn't say whether or not they mulch. And I mm -hmm. feel that gardens that are mulched with straw or even grass clippings or, or even a, um, a fabric type mulch or something, cardboard is way better at controlling uh, some of the fungal diseases. And also the fall cleanup is so mm -hmm. important to remove the dead foliage because if it stays around or even, um, some dead foliage on their um, cages can spread from year to year, especially the uh, early blights and things. So 
I think that's important too. Okay. Jennifer Fishburne, you're muted, but anything you want to add? <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you could see that. <laughs> I would just add to that um, to make, as Jennifer mentioned, to look for resistant varieties. But the other thing would be to figure out what what the resistance you're looking for. Um, so properly identifying those diseases, while they may all be happening at the same time, they may all be something different on each plant. So identifying what the problem is is going to be key to knowing what resistance you may be trying to look for. Some things you can't. The other thing would be that might help you for next year in applying some preventative fungicides um, because those are preventative, not after the fact. So that would, all of what we said is it's it's one one big thing. It's not just one thing that you're going to do, but many things, multiple things that you're going to do to control this problem. Wonderful. Th ladies, thank you so much. This was a great show. A lot of good information. Really appreciate you guys uh, for sharing your time and talents. And we'd like to thank you for sticking with us through this maggot home that we've done. We've grown into it. I think we've gotten better at it. So thanks for hanging with us. And we will see you next time on Mid-American Gardener. Good night.